right, excited to start this new series going through 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and we'll just work our way through that, Lord willing, chapter at a time, and so uh, always enjoyed these books. There are some confusing verses, as you're probably well aware, some confusing verses in the sense of almost sounds like uh, it's saying that you can lose your salvation or that there's some works involved to your salvation. A lot of people have been confused. If you've deb debated with somebody on that topic, a lot of times they'll take you to some verses in this book. But right off the bat, we see in 1 John that this book is about fellowship. It's about fellowship. And fellowship is important, you know. Uh, to the believer, you, 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 no man is an island unto himself. You can't just stay at home. I mean, people say it all the time. You know, I don't have to go to church. I can just worship God right here. Well, yeah, but people need you, and you need other people, and we need to be able to help each other, encourage each other, and get each other uh, uh, through this. That's the way it was designed. That's the way that uh, uh, God wants it to be. So here right off the bat, you see fellowship. You know, he's saying our fellowship, verse 3 there, that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And then uh, later on in verse 7, it says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. In that blood of Jesus Christ, His Son cleanseth us from all sin. So, you know, there's a difference between my son Zachary here and I, being father and son and having good fellowship as father and son. So there is a difference in somebody having good fellowship with the Lord. And if we're out of fellowship with the Lord, doesn't mean we're going to hell. doesn't mean we're not his child anymore. And so uh, this is the kind of thing that people get confused. Now, actually, John says here in this book, he says several times, this is why I'm writing this stuff. These are the, this is the reason I'm writing. Look at 1 John 1, 4. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. That's what we'll be talking about this afternoon, that your joy may be full. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Look at chapter 2, verse 26. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So, uh, so he's kind of telling you in bits and pieces why he's writing the things that he's writing. And so first of all, if we can get any kind of, a, uh, of an understanding as to what he's writing... Uh, first of all, in this section here, we see that he is uh, talking about our joy, that our joy may be full. Okay, so the title of the message is Staying Full of Joy. You know, he has to, why does he have to remind these people? Because probably their joy is not always just naturally full, right? So he has to write these things that their joy may be full. And uh, oftentimes in our life, we will find ourselves uh, running on empty, right? Just not having that joy. Even David said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, right? And so sometimes we'll find ourselves not having that joy that we used to have. <clears throat> so number one, uh, right here in verse one through five, we see here's how we can have joy. Here's how we can keep our joy. Number one has to do with fellowship in the light. He talks a lot about the light, and uh, that's interesting. Look, at, Let's read the first five verses again. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Now you try to wrap your mind around what, they, what the Bible actually means when it says God is light. 
And I've heard a lot of speculation. I've heard really great points, good messages preached on it. And, uh, and I, I suppose there's a little truth maybe in a lot of the different things. But my mind, I always think about the truth. You know, when somebody sees the truth, they, they were kind of blind before, but whenever they see the truth, it's like the light goes off, you know. Uh, and actually, the Bible is very consistent on this. It talks a lot about the light. And uh, I, I actually, I don't know about you, but I don't like when things are just dim all the time and gloomy. You know, if you go into a restaurant and it's dim, you might say, oh, it's a romantic atmosphere. No, it's just hiding all the dirt and the filth and the roaches. The, it's just hiding. You don't know what's out there because it's dark. <laughs> Turn that light on and you see everything scurry. <laughs> the light exposes what's, in the, what's hiding in the darkness, right? So I like to see what I'm doing. Uh, uh, maybe if you're in a, a building, I do this in the church sometimes. I'll be working in the office and nobody's there. It's getting really late. And you just start hearing some noises or something like that. But man, when all the lights are on, <laughs> it's a lot, it's just a lot more calming. When it's dark, you're just kind of like, oh, what's over there? Did I just see a shadow? And yesterday I, I was heard, hearing some last night, and in fact, I was hearing some creaking uh, on the floor, and I'm like, oh, it's just sounds, you know, the wind. I always hear that stuff, and I'm I'm typing out some stuff, and, and all of a sudden the the uh, there's a motion sensor light in the, at the front door now. And it just like spontaneously just came on. And I was like, oh, somebody's out there. <laughs> <laughs> right, but they're exposed now because of light shining on them. But it, you, you see what I'm saying? We like lights. I mean, I can't imagine what it was like in the time where, in order to get some light, you had to light a candle and you had to put that candle up high, maybe light a bunch of candles or whatever. Because now we can just flip on all the lights, and I, and I don't like those dim, like kind of yellowish looking lights, you know, like 40 watts or something like that. No, I like 100 watts, you know, full. B now I know they got LED and stuff, but I'm just saying I like it to be bright. Uh, especially in the church building or something like that, uh, because there's something comforting about light, and there's something exposing about light. You know that you can see everything. You're not going to trip. You know uh, th these are the kind of things. Uh, the Bible says in John three nineteen, and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. And look, men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. We're evil. And so, you know, I'm a big believer in light. I like to go outside. I like to go. Uh, in fact, I think this whole coronavirus thing is cured just by going out in the sun. <laughs> just kidding. But there's some truth there. Going out in the sunlight, uh, being exposed to the light and to the, uh, and to the vitamin D that you get from that. And, and uh, it's good. People that are like, oh, man, I can't leave my house. You know, I'm afraid of germs or whatever. And they, they, they confine themselves inside the house. All that. They're actually hurting their health. Right. Because uh, because they're they're not going out there. I don't know where I got off on that. But the idea is light, not necessarily sunlight, but the light. OK, Jesus describes himself often as life and light. You know, and I think these two go together a lot. In fact, the Bible talks about, you know, after the heaven and earth has passed away, new heaven, new earth. And it says there is no sun. Right. Because the lamb and God are the light thereof. And so all throughout the Bible, very consistent. The Bible talks about light. Look at Isaiah chapter nine. Isaiah nine. Verse two. <clears throat> it says the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Isaiah 63, 60 verse 3. Isaiah 60 verse 3. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Uh, you, you know, in the Old Testament, it was, it was known, it was understood if they would have read that and paid attention to what they're saying, that they were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. They were supposed to be a light to the world, right, to show. Now, they didn't understand it all. 
And of course, when John the Baptist came, his job was to, was to uh, expose who Jesus was. Look at, look at John. Same author, obviously, as, as the epistles of John. John chapter 1 talks about this very thing. I read something from John 3 about the condemnation, but even at the beginning of the Gospel of John, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of that light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own. And his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When somebody comes to the Lord, and they believe in him, and they understand, and that light goes off, guess what? They're saved now. They can see, uh, you know, I saw the light, uh, That's as the old song goes. We can uh, see him, and, and all of a sudden made to see. Now, here's an interesting thought. Now, God says, you're the light. Right? Jesus is the light, and now we're going to be a light to the world. What is the light that we're actually shining? We're shining Jesus. Right? I've heard it explained like this. You don't see this necessarily anywhere in the Bible, but I've heard it explained like this. you got the sun, right? and the sun shines bright. It's creating its own light. And then you've got the moon. And the moon, the Bible calls it the lesser light, but really, you know, the moon's not creating any light of itself. It's just reflecting the sunlight. Okay, and so when we see the light, I mean, you can go on the trail at nighttime, full moon out, you can see pretty much everything, but that's not actually providing light of itself, it's providing light from the sun, right? And so what's, that's kind of what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be lights as we go reflect Christ, and as we go take Christ to the world, we are actually being a light. Matthew 5, 14 says it this way, Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto, unto all that are in the house. So the first way we can, our joy can be full, according to John. If you want your joy to be full and to stay full, uh, first thing you need to do is to have fellowship in the light. Now, obviously, when you read your Bible, you pray, you have time with the Lord, you're, you're having fellowship with the Lord. But not only that, uh, the Bible makes it clear we're supposed to have fellowship one with another. And that's what he says right there in 1 John. And we see other places. That's why we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It's very important that we help each other and that we are, are, are in fellowship one with another. Amen. So, uh, you know, when I started... When I became the pastor at Iola Baptist Temple, I had this, this thought, and it uh, didn't necessarily stick, but I still kind of use it, but I had this thought that, uh, of, of, uh, of worship, discipleship, and fellowship. And I was thinking, hey, what is our job as a church? What are we supposed to do? You know, looking at the Great Commission and all, and I thought, well, definitely the Bible talks about how we're supposed to worship the Lord. I'm not talking about praise and worship, you know, like the charismatics do. I'm talking about worship as in falling on our face and, you know, we want to know what God's will is. Not our own selves, you know, we, we want to put God in His rightful place. This is what worship is, okay? And so in the Bible, when somebody worships, guess what, what their posture is like? It's actually not like this, although I suppose there's a type of worshiping that could be with their hands raised. But in the Bible, when it says worship, it's, they're bowing down. I mean, they're on their face, flat. Because when you recognize who God is and how low you are and how high He is, man, you just, you just can't speak. Some of the prophets, they hear from God and they're just like deaf. Deaf, mute. <laughs> they can't say anything. They're just mute. They can't, they, they can't. Some of them fall to the ground as, as if they were dead, right? Because they are standing in the presence of God. And so, uh, so we ought to uh, have uh, fellowship one with another and fellowship with the Lord. Oh, I know what I was saying. Okay, worship. <laughs> okay, 
worship. And then the second thing was fellowship. Now, we need to worship the Lord, but then it's also important that we come together. That's the whole purpose of meeting, right? Our, 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 you guys know this, but our vision isn't that we would just fill the church with lost people. Now, I, I mean, I would love to fill the church with lost people, but it just doesn't typically happen that way. We go out, find the lost people, give them the gospel. Hopefully, they come in for fellowship. But meanwhile, all the believers, we need to come back and get recharged, right? We need to come back and, and, uh, and fellowship in that light and to, uh, uh, to bear one another's burdens and all this kind of stuff that the Bible uh, tells us to do when we come together. Okay, so if your number one was to walk in the light, then the second point would be this, common sense, don't walk in darkness. Go back to our text there, 1 John. If you want your joy to be full, you can't walk around in darkness. John chapter 1, verse 8. <clears throat> if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Uh, back up actually to verse 6, I'm sorry. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. I got ahead of myself. So, if we're going to walk in darkness and claim in, you know, hey, we have fellowship with God. Hey, we love the Lord. We, we have joy in the Lord, yet we're walking in darkness. We're actually lying to ourselves. And here's the thing about darkness. You know, somebody can get used to the dark. After a while of being in the dark, you get to where you can, you can see pretty good, right? I used to run, uh, I'd run on the trail at nighttime. Creepy, I'm telling you. Like I said, I like light. I like the sun. I don't really like not being able to see what's ahead of me on the trail. But I used to run at night, and I would use a headlamp so that I could see what's coming at me on the trail. And, uh, and I found out that on a good uh, day where the moon is, uh, the sky's clear and the moon's out bright, it w I could actually see better if I shut my headla headlamp off, all right? Because you kind of get adjusted to the natural light. And if you get your headlamp on, it only goes so far, and then you can't see beyond that. But if you allow your eyes to just kind of adjust and you get used to that, everybody know what I'm talking? You ever been in the dark long enough and all of a sudden, like, you say, no, it's not so bad, right? I can, uh, we can also do that with our vision. I remember, um, how many people in here wear glasses or contacts or something along those? Uh, so I was probably, I probably needed glasses when I was like 11, 12 years old. Didn't get them until I was 16. <laughs> I didn't wear glasses. I didn't want to admit that I had a vision problem, so I got used to it. Anybody, can, can anybody relate to that, right? So I'm literally at school walking down the halls Right, trying to squint because I don't know if the people are looking at me or they're not looking at me. And so I just pretend they're all looking at me and I'm like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> I'm sitting in the, uh, in the seat, can't see the chalkboard. And so, uh, you know, the teachers, you know, what's, what's wrong? Can't you read that on the board? No, I can't read that on the board. You know how they alphabetize you and they put you according to your name, right? If I was in the back, it was like, I can't see. I, I cannot see whatever she writes on the board. How dumb. <laughs> I just got used to living that way and didn't even care. You know, I, it was, I can get by. I can, I, can, I can still make it, right? But how much better it would have been if I could actually see. You know, when I finally decided to get glasses, I went to baseball tryouts. And remember, that was my goal, uh, is to one day be a baseball player. I went to baseball tryouts, and they couldn't have it outside. I could see outside in the sunlight a whole lot better than I could see inside. But uh, it was raining, so they didn't have tryouts outside. We had to go inside the gym. And... I was in place to receive a, 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 a ground ball, and the coach threw up the ball, hit a ground ball at me, and I'm like, it just went right past me, and I didn't even know it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I hit the ball. <laughs> he said, I want you to have glasses by tomorrow. Of course, you couldn't get them that fast, but, uh, but that's when I was like, okay, I finally got to get glasses. But my point is this. We can live in a bad condition and get so used to it where we pretend like, oh, that's, that's okay, you know. You can live in a dim lighting sometimes. You'll go visit at someone's house one time, and they're like, I guess trying to save electricity or something like that, but in their entire house, they got like one bulb. And you're like, man, how can you see in this place, right? 
<laughs> get some lights in here, right? Because what is, they, get, they just got used to it. You get used to it, you don't think that you need the light. But if we walk in darkness, we're not going to be full of joy. You know, I'm talking spiritually now. If we're walking in darkness, we're not going to be full of joy. Now, we can get used to it. Like, that's oh, all right. Things are going pretty good. Might not even forget the joy. Here, here, here's what I, you know, this is like uh, so many things. If I'm, if I'm working out when I haven't worked out in a long time, if I'm eating healthy when I haven't, haven't eaten healthy in a long time, whatever, once I start doing it, I always, why did I wait so long? <laughs> like, why didn't I? Why did I wait so long? I just got so used to this habit, so used to this way of life, right, that I just neglected the things that I know are good for me. And it's the same like that. It's the same thing in our Christian life. We can get so used to just being stagnant, so used to just living a life that we know is not bringing us joy, and we pretend that we're happy, we pretend that everything's okay, but really, if we would just get out of walking in this darkness. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. You say, I want specifics. What's it like to walk in darkness? What do you mean? Oh man, I could read the whole chapter. <clears throat> Let's just start with verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let, not man, let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God unto the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. And it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. So if you're a child of the light, you should be walking in the light. What's that mean? Well, it talks about don't be jesting, you know. Don't be, you know what I was talking about with jesting and uh, filthiness and foolish talking? Yeah, that's the locker room talk, you know. That's this, uh, I went to two different Bible colleges, and you know, both places I went, somebody at some point, uh, a leader, had to come out and talk to the people that were living in the dorms and say, hey, we need to stop this because people were joking around and uh, it's, it, I don't even want to talk about what they were doing, okay? But they were joking around, making jokes, and, and pretending to be doing things and, and all this kind of stuff. And the guy said, hey, you guys are supposed to be Christians. You're at Bible college. You can't, be, you can't be doing this kind of stuff. And they thought it was harmless. They thought, oh, we're just having fun. Hey, we're away from mom and dad. You know, we're just having a good time. But no, no, no. We have got to recognize we're children of light. We can't be walking in darkness. Amen. And it gets so easy to fall into it whenever we're in the world constantly going to work. We're around unsaved uh, friends, family, or whatever, and we see them doing the things that they do. But uh, we should not be, uh, those things shouldn't even be named among us. Like I said, you can, you can learn to get used to it. You can even think that you like it, you're enjoying that lifestyle. But I guarantee you, if you're a child of God, you're a child of the light, and it's not bringing you full joy. You might lie to yourself and say that it's bringing you joy, uh, but it's not bringing you joy. <clears throat> Operating in the darkness is hard on the soul. <laughs> Operating in darkness is depressing, right? Uh, anybody work the night shift? I know Brother, Brother Nick does. I used to work night shifts. I remember that. And I remember getting used to it and saying, I kind of like the night shift. Maybe I'm a night owl. Maybe I'm supposed to be doing this. No, I don't care who you are. Somewhere down the road, that catches up with you. <laughs> and it begins to wear and tear on your body. And the night shift is, is, uh, is hard on a person. Uh, one time I actually uh, uh, I asked uh, Pastor Anderson, 
we were talking about different things, and you know, he, I figured he's, he and I are alike in, in some ways as far as uh, uh, just kind of always staying busy and doing all these things, and kind of, I felt like operating on just a small amount of sleep. I later found out he, he's pretty big on getting a full night's sleep, right? I think he gets like eight hours of sleep a night or something like that. So, but I had told him, hey, I'm studying this thing, and I can't even remember what it's called right now, but basically throughout the day, you just take little naps. Right, you never actually get a full night's sleep. You ever heard of heard of this kind of? You just take little naps throughout the day. And I said, I think I can get by on this kind of stuff. And I text him, Have you ever heard about this? Because we just talk sometimes about running or or exercise or nutrition, whatever. And I said, Have you ever heard about this? And he sent back and he said, No, I'm big on sleeping at night. And he said, All I can think about is this verse. He said, First Thessalonians five seven, for they that that sleep sleep in the night, and they that are drunken be drunken in the night. <laughs> so he's saying, Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're going to uh, sleep, sleep in the night, you know, you don't want to be awake because all the bad stuff's going on at nighttime. That's when we're, we're supposed to be sleeping. But anyway, I thought that was kind of funny. <clears throat> so, you know, I talked about running in the dark. Uh, whenever I used to run uh, in the dark, when you do an ultra, at some point you will be running in the dark because of how many hours it, you're out running. And, uh, and so what I would do is I would, I would just kind of get used to running in the dark and I think ah oh, this isn't so bad but you know when that sunlight comes up if you're ever running super early in the morning and it's dark when that sunlight comes up man you're like recharged there's this like new sense of energy and I kind of think of it like whenever you haven't been in church for a while or you you just haven't been living for the Lord and then you come back and it's just like it's like you know you just you got energized all right so number three this is real quick but uh, we talked about how to keep your joy full, all right? Staying full of joy. Number one, fellowship in the light. Number two, don't walk in darkness. Number three, I think this is real important. Look at verse 9 of our text. 1 John 1, look at verse 9. Now I can read this part. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, right, all unrighteousness. I guarantee you're going to have a lot more joy when you're forgiven. <laughs> a lot more joy when you don't have that extra stress of, uh, of that sin that you're struggling with hanging over you. Man, we need to confess that, get that right. Repent of that. Tell, uh, tell it to the Lord and get somebody uh, to help us out with that. So, And of course, he says, if you say you have not sinned, uh, you make him a liar, and his word is not in you, in us. I, I can't believe there's still people out there that say that they no longer sin, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> right? Exactly. And, and people that actually think like the day that I got saved, now they'll admit that they sinned some point in their life, but the day they got saved, they just stopped sinning. Now they love everybody, and they don't. The Bible says Liar. they're lying, right. <laughs> and they've deceived themselves. Okay, so. Since we all know that, we got that out of the way, okay, we're all sinners. So what we need to do is work on not walking, in the, not walking in the darkness, work on getting those things out of our life. But look, sometimes we don't even recognize our need. We don't even recognize how bad it is. We have to, this goes back to fellowshipping in the light, fellowship with believers. We have to get back on track uh, by, uh, by confessing, number one, confessing our sins to the, to the Lord, of course. And then two, by, uh, by getting together with believers and uh, asking for prayer and all that. So how do we stay in this condition? And I'm not, you know, I don't think there is any way to just constantly just, uh, you know, remain in a state of our Christian life where our joy is full and everything is going great. I just don't think it's possible. I've never met anyone like that. There's always ups and downs. Uh, you know, just like everything in life, you know, it's kind of uh, it's kind of frustrating if you think about all the things in life. The ladies understand this: the dishes, man, they're always dirty. You can get all the dishes done, but tomorrow there's going to be more, or later that day. <laughs> My wife's like, tomorrow. How about the grass? This time of year, you could mow your grass twice a week, and it still needs to be mowed. It seems like, you know. And so you're like, well, I just got the lawn all mowed, all trimmed. Everything looks great. Well, you can't quit because next week, guess what? It's going to be there again. Yeah. <laughs> 
Everything in life is that way. I remember when I had a cleaning business in Oklahoma City. I mean, I still kind of do, but uh, I had a cleaning business in Oklahoma City, and I would clean different things, apartments, offices, uh, residential, and I would clean their home. And I realized this one day, you know, I was thinking this about this particular job, but really this is true for most things. I, I was like, you know, you don't typically get recognized for doing a good job when you clean something. You get, you know, exposed for missing something. <laughs> like you didn't clean that very good, right? But they typically just say, wow, it's so clean in here. Now you can deceive people, you know, if you make the, uh, the faucet shine, the mirror shine, get something that smells good, they'll be like, wow, man, you really cleaned nice in here. You're like, you're just smelling stuff, right? But typically people don't just walk around, they don't notice that it's clean because it's supposed to be that way. But what they do notice is whenever there's something in the corner or there's some dust on something, they notice the bad things and you feel like, man, I'm so underappreciated. No, that's life. <laughs> Everything in life has to be kept up on or else it will decay, it'll go bad. You know, <laughs> you got a garden. I mean, the, uh, Solomon talks a lot about that. You know, he looks off into this garden and when somebody hadn't taken care of it, it just overgrew, you know, with, with all kinds of weeds and stuff like that. Everything in life uh, requires some upkeep. <clears throat> are you, uh, let, let's show a hands here. How many of you guys are the type that run your gas tank on fumes every single time? <laughs> <laughs> every single time I'm running on fumes and I'm like, man, I sure hope I can make it to the next gas station, right? That's just, that's, that's how I do, right? Now, there are some people who have learned over the time, like, I don't want to be in that constant state of wondering if I'm going to run out of gas. And so they have to take measures and put measures into place to make sure they're always going to have a full tank of gas. Me, it feels like every time I have a full tank of gas, one of my cars breaks down. I'm like, well, there was a waste of a gas. <laughs> <clears throat> but you understand, it is stressful to not know if you got enough gas in the tank. And so you're, you're going to have to decide, do I want that stress in my life or do I want to uh, get that, uh, uh, you know, so you establish a, half, a, a, a habit. Maybe your habit is, okay, when the tank gets to half tank, it's empty. And you got to train yourself to think that, all right, half a tank, it's empty. I got to fill it up. Or maybe, you know, every day before I go home, I'm just going to make sure it's topped off, you know, and that's how you would, you know, make sure that you always have a full tank. What about uh, your refrigerator? <laughs> Don't you hate it whenever you go to get out the milk and somebody left like one, one tiny sip, definitely not enough for your cereal. <laughs> and you're like, really? Why don't you just finish it off and throw the thing away, right? But you hate to go to the refrigerator and you're out of milk, right? We used to do this uh, at my house growing up. We still kind of have this policy, I guess, but there's not usually any pop in the fridge. But growing up, if we had pop in the fridge, my dad would maybe buy, you know, uh, a 12 pack of Coke or something like that. So we have cans of Coke off to the side. And there was this kind of understood rule that if you got a cold Coke out of the fridge, you replaced it with a warm Coke because you don't want to go, man, get, get done mowing the yard, thinking, man, an ice cold Coke sounds real good right now. Open up the fridge and there's nothing in there. And now you, all you got is hot Coke. And you got, so he was like, always, you got to take the hot one out. And whenever you take a cold one, you got to put the, the hot one in there. Does that make sense? Yeah. But there had to be something in place, you know, something, hey, if we're going to not have to, every time we open up the fridge, say, ah, who drank the last of the milk? Who, put, who didn't put the, 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 you have to put these measures in place so that you will be able to, uh, to not, not have that happen, okay? So spiritually speaking, it's the same way. We're going to have to establish some habits if you want your joy to be full. He didn't say there's some magical pill. He didn't say the moment that you get saved, you're just always going to have complete fellowship with God and you're going to walk in the light. No, you're going to have to do it yourself to take measures to be able to do that. So what are the measures you have to take? Well, we have to stay full of joy. We're going to have to commune with, commune with God regularly. So if we get into a point where we say, you know, I'm just not reading my Bible like I used to read my Bible. I'm not having prayer time. I'm not doing this. Well, what's going on? Because there's still 24 hours in a day. You know, we have to make a habit. Every day at this time, I'm going to read my Bible. 
Every day, first thing whenever I wake up, some people will, some people have that. They're, they're part of their routine. They wake up, they're going to read their Bible, they're going to pray. But you've got to have, it's not just going to automatically happen in your life. You're going to get comfortable with the state that you're in. You're going to always develop bad habits. Man, bad habits are so easy to pick up. I mean, just, I'm just telling you, you don't have to work at those. They just come. Good habits are so hard to establish. And uh, we were talking before about, I think, 30 days or 40 days to establish a habit, and that's typically the case. I mean, if you say, I'm going to start doing this, well, you better do it for a month. You better do it for 40 days and establish a habit. But it's going to take work on your part. You want your joy to be full. God's not going to do it for you. You're going to have to put measures in place to make sure the joy is full. So uh, what do we do? Fellowship in the light. We have communion with God regularly. We fellowship with God's people regularly. What's that mean? Well, you're going to have to make yourself go to church. You have to make yourself get together with believers. Uh, make yourself go soul winning. You know, you guys, everybody in here that's been soul winning knows, you know, there's some, something more. Now, now, you're doing something that's the most important thing in the world. I mean, saving a soul is much better than, you know, anything else you can do with your time. But, it, but, there, but there's so many other uh, aspects to going soul winning. The fellowship is always great. There's always a sense of... Uh, uh, of joy that comes through it because of, of just it's just walking in the light it's doing the things that God called us to do and and all these after you do it now it's real easy to get out of the habit it's real easy to not make it an important thing in your life but once you do it you're always like man why you know why didn't I get back to doing this sooner make it a habit brother Justin and I were talking about how uh, he used to have to go by himself every every day out in Wellsville uh, or I don't remember where you were a gardener or something like that and you would have to go soul winning by himself. The amount of motivation it takes to go soul winning by yourself uh, every week is, is just incredible. I mean, it's almost, it's, it, it's, it almost can't be done, but I know it can be done because people do it. But it's so hard. You might be able to make yourself go do it a little while, uh, you know, but, it, but, but that's tough. That's going to take some motivation, but more how much better whenever you got people right here that will go door knocking with you uh, to just come and establish a habit with them. Number three. Uh, let's see, uh, another thing, we have to be willing to ask for help when we're uh, overloaded. You know, ask for help when you need help. Ask for help when you feel like, uh, you know, you're falling back into sin and you're in a rut. Don't be afraid. I, I, I get calls uh, from d different people, and I know sometimes uh, people probably think, hey, I'm bothering him or I don't want to, you know, keep putting this on his plate or whatever, man, call me because I know uh, how, how needful it is. And you got brothers and sisters in Christ right here. I love to talk to you and help you through those times. And so we got to be willing to do these kinds of things. All right. Fellowship in the light. Don't walk in darkness. And when you find yourself in darkness, call for help. These are the types of things we can do to have our joy be full. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, the church for which you died and uh, gave your life, Lord. I, I pray that you will help us to walk in the light as you're in the light and that we would refrain from uh, living in darkness and uh, help us to, to uh, just deny the flesh, get those things out of our life that would be keeping us from having our full joy. Lord, we want to keep our joy full, so I pray you help us, give us wisdom that we might be able to establish some habits and some patterns in our life that would help keep that joy full. And, uh, and I pray that you'll just take these words and this concept, Lord, and apply it to all of our hearts and minds and help us in Jesus' name. Amen.